So I want to pivot now and introduce our keynote speaker today, Preeti Christel. Preeti is an attorney and co-founder of, co-founder of IMAC, a nonprofit organization building a more just and equitable medicine system for all. She is a current presidential leadership scholar and an Ashoka Fellow, and her TED Talk about the high cost of prescription drugs in America has been viewed more than 2 million times in 2020. She and the IMAC team have spent the past 20 years litigating and advocating for medicines access alongside communities around the world, saving health systems billions of dollars. Their work has been featured everywhere from CNN to the New York Times, and most recently their research featured prominently in drug pricing hearings and reports by the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Kaiser Permanente is a proud supporter of IMAX work, and we are so pleased that uh, Preeti is here with us today to share IMAX framework for how we can better understand racial inequities from drug development to access. And with that, Preeti, I will turn it to you. Thank you so much, Marie. It's really my pleasure to be here today. We are in a once in a generation moment. Just a few weeks ago, I watched my two year old son look up at the television as Kamala Harris daughter of Oakland, born in a Kaiser hospital, no less, addressed the nation as vice president-elect. And sitting in my house in Oakland, watching my son watch her, I felt it in my bones. We are going to heal our country, only if we act now. 2020 has been a crash course in educating Americans about public health and it's birthed yet again an urgency for racial justice and healing. The country has never been more attuned to our global interdependence or to the power of innovation and equity. Never. You all know this. You've been living and breathing this pandemic. You've seen the heartbreaking disparities. I am so grateful for you choosing to be here today. I see this as a legacy moment, a pivotal time when we can have impact for generations to come. My job today is to give you a big picture of the system we are poised to transform and then hand it over to some of my mentors and heroes to guide us through. As you listen to my description of the medicine system today, I invite you to think very personally about where you fit in. What is your part to play in seizing this moment? Let's make some meaning today. Reconnect with our legacy. Are you ready? Okay, let's jump in. So you might be wondering, what is the medicine system? And it's a term that I made up because we don't really have language to capture the system from drug development all the way through to drug access. Today, let's think about it as having seven parts. At each one, structural racism is a bottleneck to getting people the medicines that they need. Let's start with access, and today we're gonna go right to left because we always start first with the people who are most affected. Let's meet today Dr. Felucio Facoretti. Felucio is a cardiologist in Mississippi who is fighting to change the fact that black diabetics undergo diabetic amputations at triple the rate of others. Why this disparity? There are many reasons and access to medicines is one. First, his patients have to face unthinkable trade-offs. State Medicaid restricts providers to only give a patient six prescriptions per month. And for those who don't qualify for government assistance, the drugs are often still unaffordable. For black patients in the Mississippi Delta, many of whom have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension, this has life and death consequences. Think of an adult daughter standing at the pharmacy counter trying to decide whether to treat her mother's diabetes or hypertension that month. Now think about yourself standing at that same counter. Congress has taken some important steps in the right direction by holding hearings on prescription drug costs. But most of these hearings have relied on testimony from drug maker CEOs. Congress also needs to hear from patients and providers, especially those of color, who know firsthand how lack of access to medicine rips people from their loved ones, 
bankrupts hardworking families and fuels a system that only works for the most privileged. They need to hear from people like Volusio. Now, access is intimately connected to healthcare delivery. That is the manner in which medicines actually reach patients. There are unfortunately so many examples of medical providers diagnosing and prescribing differently for black patients. Studies have repeatedly shown that black patients in pain are not guaranteed the best possible care when they walk through the doors of a hospital. No matter how dear the Hippocratic Oath is in theory to those in white coats who walk those halls. Now, none is as poignant to me as the examples involving children. In a study nationally of 1 million acute appendectomies in young people, black kids in severe pain were five times less likely to receive the optimal medication for their pain than those who were white. Their pain is just not taken as seriously, and it affects what medicines are prescribed. Now, these first two parts showed us the patient experience, and now we're going to move to the next five. And I'm going to pose a theory to you that we failed in these five parts, not by mistake, but by design. The market is functioning exactly as it was designed to function. We got the incentives all wrong, morally wrong and economically wrong. The system literally takes black and brown lives and we stand by and we let it. It's not a market failure. It's a market sin. And we can redesign it, but the first step to redesigning it is culturally responsive innovation. So what do I mean by that? It's another made up term, and it comes down to truly meeting the health needs of all people, particularly those who have been most historically marginalized. It recognizes that our systems, including drug development, are not as objective as we think. It's a way to build a more responsive, accurate market because it's actually based on building solutions for people who need them, by people who need them. Not some sort of conjecture or abstract incentive that leads to missed opportunities, inflated pricing, and lost lives. Now, one of the most dignifying, efficient ways to do that is to unleash the power and genius of black and brown people with the most expertise on the problem so they can lead us to build the solutions. Not in a tokenizing, box-checking kind of way, but with an overdue reverence for their insight. As you know from your own lives, when you have firsthand knowledge of a problem, when you have skin in the game, you get after finding that solution with more depth and more gusto. It's just common sense. So today, let's start with suppliers. Suppliers refers to private sector companies involved in medicine discovery and development. We think about this in three ways. When it comes to the Fortune 500, today only four CEOs of the 500 are black. That's less than 1%. Only one is pharma related, and that's Ken Frazier at Merck. For small and medium-sized businesses, we know that there's only a few black-founded biotech and life sciences businesses in the country. These companies don't just work on problems affecting their communities. They create jobs and opportunities. And then there are startups. On average, black-owned businesses receive 37 times less outside equity investment than white-owned startups. Can you begin to imagine the scientific progress that we are missing out on? It is dizzying to think about. There is so much we could discover if we get this right. And for the investors in the room, you are in for a treat today. Today we have Lily Onavakpuri here. She's a partner from Caper Capital, and she's going to share her insight with us as an investor in health technologies. Next up is regulatory, and by this I mean the government entities that determine the safety and efficacy of drugs and devices. Here in the U.S., it's the FDA. 
Now I know that representation in clinical trials is top of mind for everyone right now. And I am so excited that the next forum is gonna do a deeper dive into that issue. So I'm not gonna spend that much time here today except to tell you a story. So, you know when you go to the doctor and they clamp that little piece of plastic onto your finger to measure your oxygen levels? Well, that doesn't work the same for everybody. Researchers for the last decade have been trying to draw attention to the fact that pulse oximeters do not work as well for darker skin patients. The acceptable FDA margin of error is 3%. But for black patients with low oxygen levels, these pulse oximeters actually have an unacceptable 8% margin of error. Now, it turns out there are three manufacturers who make these products. None of them enrolled sufficient numbers of darker skinned people in their trials. The FDA did not require them to, and Congress still has not legislated on this. We're in the middle of a global pandemic where oxygen measurement is critical to saving lives. We can and we must do better. So now we move to the next three parts and I have a confession to make. I am a total nerd about these three. So let's start with patents. Patents are rewards in the form of time-limited monopolies issued by the U.S. government in our country that are meant to protect ideas and incentivize invention. Now, structural racism has a long history in our patent system, as documented by author Harriet Washington. Like redlining, the patent system played a huge role in denying Black people opportunities for upward mobility. Opportunities that were readily available to white people. Enslaved people were prolific inventors, devising new ways of working and doing. An enslaved person from Kentucky invented the hemp break, which separated the shells from the fiber on a stock of hemp. In Alabama, an enslaved person invented a machine for cleaning cotton. But these inventors were never allowed to patent their inventions. In the South, it was their white enslavers who got the patents instead. Quite literally, the ingenuity of black people was appropriated and monetized. Now that legacy persists. Leading economist Dr. Lisa Cook's research indicates that between 1975 and 2008, less than 1% of patent holders were black. Now, is that because of structural racism within the patent office? Or is it because of systemic barriers that make black people less likely to apply for patents in the first place? The IDEA Act, based on Dr. Cook's research, was introduced in Congress last year. It would direct the USPTO to collect demographic data on who applies for patents and then report each year on how these demographics are changing. We can't fix what we don't measure. As we transition to a new administration, we need a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office director who understands that a patent is not just a piece of paper. It's an economic leg up, and it is one that has been denied to millions of Black Americans. This is personal for me. Part of why I am so attuned to legacy is because I inherited a great one. My own father is a pharmaceutical scientist and an immigrant to this country. He spent his life searching for cures, obtained many patents, and ultimately invented a game-changing treatment. This has shaped my family in profound ways. It was an economic leg up for us, yes, but we also carried it like a special gift. It gave us purpose. It gave us belonging. We need to atone now for past wrongs, investigate racial disparities in patenting, and then move swiftly to address them. And I want to take a quick moment here to return to this idea of legacy that I seated up front. Are you thinking about where you fit in here? Are you thinking about where your generational impact gets shaped 
hand in hand with mine? We need to act now because as you know, innovation has a long tail. Next up, we're going to do investment and research together. And by this, I mean the public and private sector dollars that are directed towards the most upstream medical research efforts. Globally, more than a billion people suffer from what we call neglected diseases. And I think most Americans perceive that neglected diseases are diseases that happen only in other lower income countries. But the truth is an estimated 12 million Americans are living with conditions known as neglected tropical diseases, like toxocariasis, a parasitic worm that makes its way into the brains of children and can impair mental development. When you look at the R&D for these diseases, they are chronically underfunded. The market doesn't incentivize research in these areas because they affect poor people. And overwhelmingly, those affected are black and brown. Now, progress is possible. Last year, Senator Cory Booker introduced a first-of-its-kind bill to address the neglected diseases of poverty in the United States. And so we are very blessed today. We have the inspiring Dr. Rogelio Mejia, an expert researcher in neglected diseases, here to tell us about how we can humanize this system and quite literally save millions of black and brown lives. Let's look at one more example. Now, two articles came out this year comparing cystic fibrosis, which affects primarily white Americans, and sickle cell, which affects primarily black Americans. And although cystic fibrosis affects one-third fewer people than sickle cell, it receives 7 to 11 times the research funding per patient. When you look at philanthropic dollars, it is a staggering 75 to 1. So what's the result of this disparity in funding? Not surprisingly, there are more research studies and more new drug approvals. 15 new drug approvals for cystic fibrosis versus just four for sickle cell since 2008. So what are the factors that play into this kind of racial inequity in drug development? I'm going to show you five. Now, we sometimes call this market failures, but the truth is the incentives in the market do not align with outcomes like health equity for all people. The structural long-term work needed is that. We know that black principal investigators should be getting twice the NIH or National Institute of Health funding that they get compared to their white counterparts when you calibrate for education level and publication. Historically, federal funding to address racial disparities research has been grossly insufficient. And I'm very excited to share with you that today we have the brilliant Dr. Hannah Valentine here. She is the former Chief Officer of Scientific Workforce Diversity at the NIH to unpack these issues for us. So now going to the fourth factor. Sexy science, I say that jokingly, but it refers to the fact that the NIH focuses on the advancement of science. That's its mandate, not necessarily the advancement of public health. It is far more likely to fund things that feel edgy or new, even if investment in more established science would more meaningfully improve people's lives. So we have to ask the question, innovation for who? Now, patient advocacy groups have influence over which R&D investments get made. But here's the problem. Low-income black and brown people have less access to capital, to networks, to power. Another reason why research into diseases that disproportionately affect them are chronically neglected. I want to be really clear about what I'm saying right now. As a patient advocate, I fully support funding research for diseases affecting white or wealthy people. But those of us with a platform need to also champion investments into diseases that primarily affect low-income black and brown people. I'm going to give you one last example. 
Black children in America have the highest prevalence of asthma nationwide. They are four to five times more likely to die from it as compared to white kids. Albuterol, the most commonly used inhaler in the country, is not as effective for black kids. So who is needing that R&D need? Some people call this a market failure or a research challenge, but more to the point, it is a reflection of systemic racism embedded in our drug development system. So there you have it, seven parts that make up our medicine system as a whole. Today was just a snapshot, but there are so many more examples in each of these as bottlenecks. And just as the human body is miraculously adept at healing, we can heal this system. We can redesign it. We have the right conditions. We have the right talent. We have the right people here on this call. So now we need to start listening to them with a reverence for what's truly at stake. People's lives, our own legacy. This is it. Thank you.